What up? Hey. All right. We're back. We are back. By a show, ooh, by a show of hands, a nice soft clap. If you missed 621 last week, would you make a little clap? A little clap, just a little clap. We, uh, we, did, um, we did something really cool as a youth ministry. For those of you who made it out, Heather kind of already shared that. Um, the turkey drop was a huge, huge success. And um, what makes something a success isn't necessarily numbers. Actually, it's, it's not so much numbers. It's um, the heart, the heart behind why we did it. And so can I just tell you how grateful I was to see so many of you uh, young teenagers, young adults, learning how to adult, um, show up and participate in something that it was fun, but it was also not about you. Not about you. It was about uh, meeting real needs, real practical needs in the lives of families around us. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to know about you right now in this moment. So by a show of hands, those of you who participate in the lovely day we call Thanksgiving, how many of you enjoy food the most? You would say food is your favorite thing about Thanksgiving. If that's you, raise your hand. Food. 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 What? Okay. Okay. Um, how about this one? How, <laughs> how many of you would say you enjoy sleeping in on a school day? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. The only people not raising their hand are kids that are homeschooled. Okay, you're weird. Okay, um, and then how about this? Kind of in the same vein of sleeping in, how many of you uh, most like that you get to stay up a little later and play video games um, more that day than any other day, per se, until one of your parents or somebody says, turn the game off, put the phone down. Anybody, a couple people? Okay, my gamers are here. Okay, and then how about this one? How many of you really like or enjoy the fact that you get to spend like more time with your friends? Maybe it's the night before Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving Day, but you get to hang out and do something fun with your friends. Anybody get to hang out with your friends? Okay. And then the last one, how many of you would say that you actually enjoyed being with your family more than anything else? Raise your hand. Yep, put your hands down. Yep, that's the truth. Some of us, some of us have really great families. Some of us actually enjoy spending time with our family. Some of us actually have families that look a little like this. There you go, look alive. Go.
Is everything broken? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let me give you this disclaimer. That movie is, is a little old. It's a movie uh, called Cheaper by the Dozen. If you've never been able to enjoy that movie, I would encourage you to check it out. You see, maybe some of us have families that look like that, right? Chaotic in, in moments, and it's, it's fun, and it's festive. And, and just a side note, if you're still unsure in what to ask your parents or guardians what to get you for Christmas, let me just strongly encourage you to ask for a frog. A lot of wonderful things can come from a, a gift like a frog. But some of us, that, that kind of resembles our reality. But for others of us, that's not at all how our family looks. You see, each one of us is unique. Every person in this room, and there's roughly 110, 120 people in this room, each one of us, as unique as we are, we come from very unique families. And so it's hard to say with certainty what every family looks like or what every family should look like. But there is something we know for sure, and it's these two things. One, God didn't make a mistake putting you in the family you're in. Now let me just say something. For those of you who don't know, that's a really big statement for me because if you don't know, I'm a foster dad. And so that means that the two little boys that have, have taken up residency in my home, my boys, my, my kids, my sons, they, they're not biologically my children, but they belong in my family. And that doesn't mean that God made a mistake. That means that this God that we love, that I love, that you love, that we worship, that we believe in is so powerful that there's nothing he can't do. So one is God did, amen, God did a mistake, make a mistake putting you in the family you were in, and two, God created the institution of family. Now for some of us, that word institution is big, and we're not really sure what to make of it, and others still, the word institution implies something wrong, right? We think of hospitals or prisons and jails. <laughs> well, some of you probably would say you feel like you're living in a prison uh, when you're home. The truth is that's not at all what we mean. You see, the institution of a family is a big deal, and that means that because God has designed family, that it serves a greater purpose. That there's, there's something really important for us in our family, family dynamic, no matter what it looks like. Okay, like, just reset. Listen, if at any point you compare yourself or your family to someone else's family, that wasn't, it's not made to be done that way. But that's our nature, and I get it. I've done it too, both as a, as a child and a man. I've done that, and it's just not the truth. It's not the way God designed us. Families are unique. Every family was made to be unique. And there's this truth. You can pick your friends, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your family. And that's just a reality, right? And some of you, you know it, right? Some of you, you have siblings sitting in this room right now that if there was a trade on the table, you would be willing to make it. Or... Some of us still have, you know, those other parents. I can remember growing up as a teenager, my friend Danny, we hung out at his house every day right after school. We literally went to his house. His dad um, was, was the cool dad. And that meant that he, we had every game system made up to that date, which is really like PlayStation 2. I mean, I'm not my mold. Um, but we had it at Danny's house. And his dad would always make sure that we had the most updated games. And he was a, he was, his name was Hugh. He's passed away, but he was a great guy. And I can remember thinking, man, I wish my dad was more like that. You see, and here's the thing. And, and sometimes holidays can be a stark reminder of that, that our family just doesn't look like what we want it to look like. For some of us, the holidays seem to be a permanent reminder of just how broken or fractured our family really is. And so we find ourselves in a place where we have this thinking. Now, real quick, again, because I feel like I could just go on and on giving these disclaimers. Some of us, well, I'll get it when I get there, but 
It doesn't necessarily mean you, you're growing up in this horrific home. Sometimes it can just be wanting privacy. And so you go through the motions through school, right? You, you, you go into middle school and you start to get some more space, right? You find your identity. And, and then you start realizing that, man, I want to make my own life decision. So you get into high school. And all of a sudden you start kind of looking down the road and you see graduation. And you think, when, when graduation comes, when I graduate, then I'll get to move on. And I'll get to leave this crazy place, this institution of family. But that's not how God would have us see our family. See, God, he designed family to be a place where we would feel safe. A place where we could go to rest, a place to grow, and a place to learn. You know, it's at your age where you guys are discovering all types of new things, new feelings, new experiences, discovering who you are just bit by bit. And, and, and again, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but don't, don't put yourself in a place where you try to have a finish line by, you know, by the time you graduate high school, I need to know everything about myself. I need to be certain about who I am because if you do that, you're going to miss out on so much, Right? But there's so many lessons that God wants for us to learn within the confines of our family. There's a long list of them. But we're going to focus on one today, and it's a tough one. I just got to be real honest with you. It's a tough one. Forgiveness. Yeah, forgiveness. You see, if we just think about it a little bit backwards, sometimes we can become so paralyzed by the fractured, broken family we live in, escape seems to be the only option. So when we hear words like Colossians 3.13, we start to wonder and feel confused. It says this, Colossians 3.13, A, we're going to fragment the scripture for you. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance Against someone. Another translation says against a brother. Can I get a name? Hey, how, many, how about this? If you would agree that forgiveness is hard, would you just raise your hand? If you would agree that forgiveness is hard, would you just raise your hand? And how many of you, you can put your hands down. How many of you would agree, you don't need to raise your hands for this, but forgiveness within the family is super difficult. But it's in our family that we practice the great lesson of forgiveness. You see, here's the thing that we discover in life. And this isn't doom or gloom because trust me, the gospel comes, the sun rises. But people will hurt you and let you down. And you will hurt people and let them down too. And for some of us, we live in homes where our parents don't always trust our decision-making. And so they do this thing that some uh, psychologists have coined the phrase, they're helicopter parents, right? They're always hovering over us. Do, 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 do. I didn't even know what that really meant until I had these two little boys come into my home. And now I get it because I'm afraid that he's going to eat everything he should. Nathaniel, this little boy, this, he's 18 months old. He, if you tell him not to eat something, he will eat it. If you tell him to eat something, he don't want to have anything to do with it. So we got these helicopter parents, and you know it, right? We can make jokes and laugh about it, but you feel that tension sometimes, right? Mom, Dad, I'm an A student. I don't drink. I don't back up off me. Trust me. As some of us have families where we use words to hurt each other, right? We use words to hurt each other. I have two older brothers and a younger sibling, and we definitely qualified for this one. You see, holidays were always filled with words to provoke feelings. And they would always be, you know, those mocking-type statements, those statements that are like, you know, they're kind of low-key stabs at each other. Or some of us still, within the institution of our family, we have parents who in the public side, when we're at church or when they go uh, you know, to, a, to a school gathering, they're great. They seem like really well-to-do, understanding parents. Until we're at home and the door is shut. 
And then they just can't stand each other. And they're always fighting about something. And most often, if we're honest, it's money. It's money. And yet for some of us, we have families that are dealing with addiction and broken promises. Years, generations of addiction and broken promises. (laughs) And then there's the really tough stuff. That some of us have had to endure things like neglect and abuse. Now, now here's the thing, right? And this is the thing that if if anything's going to make you irritated with me tonight, this is going to be one of the first ones. You see, no matter which family, and there's, that, that's a very short list. The list could go on and on. I could spend an hour giving you every detailed version, and I guarantee you I still wouldn't have everyone, but there, that's a short list of how our family can be fractured, how families look fractured, but listen to this. God's response to the fractured family, no matter how it's fractured, is the same. Do you get that? To the parent who takes away your phone, because they don't think you're getting your homework done and you're playing three, four, five hours of video games in a night. To the parent who's rarely home because they're out living their own life. To the parent that's completely, completely abandoned you because they didn't want to face the hardship, the trials and the challenges of being a parent. God's response to this is the same. Colossians 3.13, read the whole thing. Now listen to this, please. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's okay to let that sting a little bit. It's okay to have a problem with that. It's okay to feel the sickness in your belly. It's okay. You see, if you were here for week one, then you might remember hearing about a family, and if you weren't, it's okay. I'm going to give you the short version. And week one, we talked about a family that was really, really jacked up. I mean, they were fractured on steroids. Like, these guys really messed it up. You see, there were these two brothers, Esau and Jacob. And really, to understand where Esau and Jacob come from, you have to look at their their parents and then their parents. Because there was a line, a lineage of family neglect and abuse and lying that happened. And so Esau and Jacob, that are brothers, find themselves in this conflict, in this relationship that is really, really bad. In short, what happens is back in those days, and I want you guys to, I want to do my best to help you understand this. Back in those days, when you were the firstborn, you were entitled to all the rights and benefits of your family. Do you understand what that means? You see, there wasn't, we didn't have, they didn't have stocks and bonds. There weren't investments. There weren't health insurance options. There there was none of that stuff. You, if, if your dad had two goats and he left you one, you were doing good. And the reality was, if you were the firstborn, that was your goat. If you were the second or third, you better hope you married someone that was a firstborn. Right? And so what happens with Esau and Jacob is Esau is the firstborn, But Jacob finds favor with his mom. And his mom convinces Jacob to trick their father, because he's blind and and, and old, into giving Jacob the benefits, the rights of the family. So Jacob and his mother conspire to trick the dad, her husband, and to steal steal the rights of Esau, the brother. This is a big, big deal. You see, Jacob, with the help of his mother, Rebekah, betrays his own brother. They plot against him very intentionally and steal his rights of being the firstborn. 
Now listen, I, again, I can't even begin to explain to you how big of a deal this was. This was like, this would have been, this would have been so catastrophic, it would have been too much for Jerry Springer. This would have been some really big stuff. You see, not only would it have impacted Esau and Jacob, but it would have impacted every person in their community because back then communities were built by families. And so everything that happened would have had a catastrophic effect. It would have impacted everyone and their community. And Esau, when he finds out what's happened, he's mad. I mean, he is so angry. Has anyone ever done something to you? Anybody in your family ever done something to you that caused you to become so angry at them? Okay, so two, two sides to this crazy coin. I asked my oldest brother, Mike, if I could share this, so I got his permission, okay? Um, so here goes. Um, I was roughly about eight years old, and my brother, Mike, who, best big brother, if you've never heard me say this, my brother, Mike, the oldest one, nine years older than me, best big brother you could ever ask for. Okay, dude had never, ever, ever beat me up, never made fun of me, never did anything to hurt me, always took care of me. Awesome. He's one of my, he's my one, he's literally probably one of my best friends in my life ever, okay? Nine years older than me and still a best friend, right? I'm eight or nine years old and my brother Mike is in high school, about to graduate, he's going into the military, he's going into the Navy and this girl that he really likes, and I didn't realize this back then, but I later found out like he liked this girl so much he was contemplating proposing to her before he left for Desert Storm, which was the, the, uh, the first Iraqi war back in the day, okay? And... And so we're, we're, we're living in southwest Detroit, and southwest Detroit has, most houses have these like big porches that are like five feet off the ground, big, right? Okay, if you don't know, you don't know, and if you know, you know. And so we're, we're, my brother's like, let me hang out with him and this girl, and they're talking. You know how you teenage seniors are. You're like low-key flirting, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest, okay? I'm an eight-year-old, okay? I want some of the attention. The girl's pretty. And so I make this comment. You see, in my family, we, we were all born with, you know, not so great complexion. And so my brother had some, like, real acne going on back then, right? And I looked at him, and I was like, man, what can I do to get some attention from this girl? And I just said the worst thing ever. I'm not, should I say it? Should I tell you? He told me I could tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Mike, you got potholes all over your face. I'm eight years old, people. Trust me. Hey, my complexion, you can look now, right? Ah, but I said it. And look, my brother, my brother looked at me like and put his head down. And I felt eight years old. I knew I felt this big. I felt so bad. He didn't marry that girl. <laughs> it wasn't my fault, but he didn't marry that girl. But I knew my brother was mad at me. I knew I hurt his feelings. And some of us, we've had those moments, right? Where a, a family member, member, a brother, a sister, maybe mom or dad said something to embarrass us in front of our friends or someone we were crushing on. Or maybe something else has happened in your life. Maybe you've experienced that abuse. Maybe something happened that even today in this moment we're talking right now, when you stop and think about it, the anger starts to well up inside of you and you can barely contain yourself. You see, Scripture tells us that Esau was so angry that he counted the days until his father would die so that he could kill his brother. He was so angry at how his brother had hurt him and his mom, his own mother, betrayed him that he counted the days. And he knew that by killing his brother, it would hurt his mother too because that was mommy's little boy. So what do you think Jacob does? What all of us little siblings do, he ran! He ran, Jacob runs. His mom tells him, Jacob, you gotta go. Esau's gonna kill you. 
And look, here's the deal, right? And this, this concept isn't that big, right? Because no matter what side of the coin you fall on, whether you're the person or you, there's been a point where you've hurt someone or someone's hurt you, we all try to run from them initially, right? We do. We don't want to be hurt. And we don't want to hurt people essentially, right? We just, we try to run from it. And that's what Jacob does. He tries to run. He tries to run. Sometimes we, again, we count those days to graduation. You know what? I'll just, I'll escape the madness when I graduate. I won't have to deal with this person anymore when I graduate. I won't have to be around him anymore. But here's the thing. In Jacob, and I believe Esau too, both experienced this. No matter where you go, there you are. You can't run from the hurt. You can't run from the grudge. So without giving you the, the long version and, and reading a couple long passage chapters of Scripture, let me just tell you that something happens with Jacob. As he runs, he, he has his own life, right? He, he gets married. He actually marries two women. He's tricked. Wouldn't you know it? And things happen. And in his life, this stuff, this trickery, this deception keeps showing up. So something happens. He has a chance experience, a chance encounter with God. He wrestles with God. God changes his name to Israel. But before this happens, you see, something else happens. Jacob hears that his brother Esau is coming for him. And not only is Esau coming for him, but he's bringing 400 soldiers with him. <laughs> 400 soldiers, people! Look, by a show of hands, no, I don't want to do it. But just think about it. If you could show up on your siblings or one of your parents with 400 soldiers, like, remember what you did? Right? Attack! Right? Jacob knows this is coming. And during the time where he's laying scared out of his mind because he knows what Esau is going to do and Esau has every right. He has this chance encounter with God. He wrestles with God and God tells him, I'm going to change your name because I'm going to change you. So Jacob surrenders. He surrenders. And this is what's so cool about Scripture. This is why I love the Bible. Man, I love the Bible like I don't love too many things. I love the Bible because it's so real. Because you know what happens next? Jacob becomes the perfect king that lives happily ever after and never has to deal with the consequences of his life. That's a lie. The very next thing we read in Scripture is that Jacob is forced to deal with his brother. The soldiers are still coming. And listen, here's the deal. When we grow up in fractured homes, when we grow up and we're hurt or we hurt people, circumstances come. Consequences to the choices we make and other people make, they come. They present themselves. And so he knows, Jacob knows he's going to have to deal with this. So we, we're going to pick up some scripture here. And I want you to pay attention to this. Genesis 33 just check this out. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Now, let me just time out real quick before we go to the next slide. Let me tell you something. So some of you might be reading that and going, wait, what? He put the women and children in front? Let's just try to understand his thinking for a minute. Someone who you essentially has, have stolen their life from them. You've hurt them so bad, and they've told you that they're going to kill you, is coming with 400 soldiers. And you know they're not just going to lay waste to you. They're going to destroy everything about you. What, Joseph, what he was doing, he was doing so that the women and children wouldn't have to watch everyone else die first. It was an actual act of mercy. 
Now, what's really cool and, and, and what we get when we start to understand this was that this is a sign of the change that has happened in his life because he's actually thinking about the well-being of other people first. The next verse, he himself went on ahead, right? So he's not hiding behind these women and children. He went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Stop right there. And so he's walking towards his brother in this big open field, and his brother with 400 soldiers marching, boom, boom. They're coming, spears, they're coming. And he's stopping, and he's getting on his knees, and he's bowing down. Can you imagine what Esau might be thinking? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smite you, homie. You're dead. He's thinking, you're mocking me. That's all you've ever done. You're mocking me. Verse 4, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck, not his hands. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Maybe this story is exactly what you need to hear right now. Maybe whatever tension or hurt you're feeling or you've experienced, maybe it's something you've caused. Maybe it's time there's a conversation. A few weeks back, you know, every weekend we have this thing called the mix on Saturday nights at 5, and then uh, we have it first and second service on Sunday. A few weeks back we talked about, I, I, gave, I gave you guys like this gem of a secret. I said, this is how you win every argument with your parents. Some of you, maybe you tried it, others you threw it out. But having a conversation where you try to understand your parents is so powerful. Where you don't go in ready to attack, but to understand Maybe some of you, that's exactly what needs to happen tonight. Tonight when your parents pick you up or tomorrow or whatever it might be with a sibling, I don't know. And still for others, maybe the thought of forgiveness is so gut-wrenching. It's so gut-wrenching because of how much hurt you've experienced. Can I just say, I get that. I get that. Last week, Pam Pratt shared her story. She shared a powerful video. She said that, that, her, that it represented her life, that her life looked a lot like that video. And you know what? Me too. Me too. I grew up in a home where I was abused physically, emotionally, and where a, a, a predator was allowed access to me. Me too. Oftentimes, here's the deal though, it can be so hard, so impossible, and seems so impossible to deal with this topic because we're, we feel out of control. And we don't know how to deal with this stuff because we feel so out of control. Let me tell you, it, it was one sentence that someone shared with me years ago that helped me understand this. He said, forgiveness isn't letting someone off the hook, it's handing the hook over to God. You see, some of us, we got a really warped sense of forgiveness because we've grown up in a fractured family. And for some of us, we think that when we forgive people, we've been taught that forgiveness means, hey, I'm going to stick around and let you do it to me again. And that's not forgiveness. And so from my mouth to your ears, if you're experiencing abuse in any way, it is not okay. And the best thing you can do is what I had to do, and that's tell someone. Tell someone. That's helping them. And then I had to experience forgiveness. I want to tell you why I had to experience forgiveness. Why I had to forgive the man who hurt me and for my own father, my own dad, because I didn't know what it was like to be forgiven. I couldn't comprehend forgiveness. It took a really hard and awkward conversation that for years I wanted to have with my dad. And finally, I mustered it up, and I sat, I sat right in front of him, his favorite chair. 
And I said, Dad, I want to be a dad one day. Why would you do what you did to me? How could you treat your kids that way? And here's the crazy thing without going into it. He said, first thing he said is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And here's the truth, you guys. My dad had told me sorry before. But the next thing he told me, <laughs> it just made sense. He said, Steve, I want for you to be a better dad than I ever was. And I could never teach you how to do that because nobody taught me. And I was too scared to go, hey, I don't know how to be a dad. Can someone show me? And so I had this moment. I had this moment for the first time in my life. I didn't see the man who abused me. I didn't see the man who put fear in my life. I saw my brother. I saw me. I saw someone who was scared and confused too. I said, I forgive you, Dad. And we cried, you know, all that weird emotional stuff, mushy. We had that moment. And oftentimes, you guys, this is why it matters because when we can't forgive people, when we hold on to that bitterness, we, don't, we can't experience God's forgiveness in our life. At that point in my life, I had met this girl, a young girl. She was still in high school. I had just gotten out of high school. Her name was Marcy, and I had realized that there were decisions I was making that essentially would lead me to be the same type of human my father was, and I didn't want to be that. I knew that if I was going to be something different, I had to deal with this, and I had to learn to accept God's forgiveness for me. Matthew 6, 14 says this. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. There have been people in my life that I have hurt really bad. Really bad. <laughs> Worse than calling a name or talking about their acne or whatever, but really Really bad. There have been people that I've hurt, and I'm sure that there have been people that you've hurt. To the extent, right, some of us, well, I, my family's not that bad. I don't have physical abuse. Yeah, but you know what? Being neglected, your parents putting work in front of you, that's hurtful. And you calling your little brother or sister a name other than their own, that's hurtful. We can't experience forgiveness for ourselves because we won't forgive other people. And remember, forgiveness isn't letting people off the hook. It's handing the hook to God. And here's the thing. This is what it's all about, you guys. This is what we can learn from the story of Esau and Jacob and what happens when they experience forgiveness with each other. It changes everything. It's a game changer. Our life no longer has to look like a reality show. We no longer have to walk through our family events, the holidays, just trying to get through it. We can experience freedom from fear and worry because we know what it means to forgive and experience forgiveness. I'm going to invite the band to come out and I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Well, this is what I want to do tonight. You see, some of us in this room, we're in this exact moment right now. We're in this exact place. We're experiencing a problem in our relationship with God because we can't understand or comprehend his forgiveness in our life. And for some of us, we, it, it, we, we can't make sense of it. We don't understand the why behind it. And this is the why. Because we're holding on to a resentment. We're holding on to a grudge. See, I believe Esau wanted to experience his own forgiveness. And so when he saw his brother, I don't know the exact moment. Scripture doesn't tell us, but when he saw his brother, he thought, God, forgive me because I'm not worthy of your grace and love either. For some of us, that's us tonight. So this is what I want to do. Real quietly, I want to have everybody stand up. The band's going to come out. David is going to play some keys for us. I'm going to pray, and I want to invite you to pray along silently. 
with me. And at some point, I'm going to ask people to do something, and it's going to be private, as awkward as it's going to seem. So I need everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. Listen to the words that come out of my mouth. Think about your family, the dynamic of your family. And maybe your family's in a good place. Maybe you do experience safety. Maybe it's a place you enjoy being and it's fun like the video that we saw. Maybe, maybe there's a friend or a cousin or someone else that you need to help understand the power of forgiveness. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. And for those of you who are in a different place where you need to be forgiven, maybe tonight is that moment where you realize that you've been a Jacob, you've been deceitful and self-centered, and you need to let go. You need to own the hurt you've caused. Or maybe you're like Esau. Maybe you've been abused and neglected, and you need to experience this forgiveness thing by giving the hook to God. No matter who you are in those scenarios, I want you to pray with me now. God, Father, I have felt stuck and I am tired, God. I am so tired of the hurt. I'm so tired of the loneliness. I'm so tired of the pain. I want to experience your freedom. I want to know what it's like to be forgiven by you because your word tells me that I'm forgiven, that your son paid that cost on the cross for my life, for my sin. And I know that in order for me to experience that, I need to give you my grudge. I need to give you the hook that someone else is on, God. I don't know what's going to come of their life. I don't know what, what, what might, you might do with them, Father, but I know that I don't want the grudge and the pain that I feel to control my life anymore. So, Father, I let go. I open up my hands. In this moment, God, and tomorrow I might struggle again, but in this moment, I give it to you. Father, would you help me forgive this person? God, for all of us, we pray this prayer, God, forgive us of our sin. Forgive us our trespasses. We love you, God. We give you all of who we are, even our brokenness. Have your way with our families. So what I want to do right now, if you prayed with me, everybody's eyes closed, everybody's heads down, if you prayed with me, would you just lift your hand? Would you just lift your hand? Would you own this forgiveness? Would you own this moment of forgiveness? Yes. There it is. That is forgiveness. Father, I pray against the enemy who would have us die from this pain and suffering. We love you, God. Have your way with our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.